Welcome back to my room of my own here. The only room available in my house, a storage closet. Yes, that's what happens when you have a big family. Anyway, uh, ignore the background or relish in it, whichever you prefer. Um, but we're going to talk about Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley next. Yes, another female great. Can't wait to share her with you. And the work of hers we read for class this week is The Mortal Immortal, a short story by Shelley, by Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley. So really fun. Um, if you look in the written out lecture, we of course have a lovely portrait of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Um, or Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley. Got to get all those names in. Yeah. Anyway, well, more on that, more on how she got all those names. But in the lecture, we have several uh, links that you can check out if you'd like to know more, you know, because sometimes that author really, you know, catches your fancy and you just like to really do some more research or have some more fun learning. Um, so there are several. There's um, a New York Public Library feature on Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley's and her life, biographical and literary information as well. Um, there's, there are some videographic presentations on Mary Shelley, her life and works on biography.com, and then some YouTube clips from a funny, engaging, highly informative lecture courtesy of Mark Steele on Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley's life, times, and works. And that's, that's a longer lecture than what we have. So if you want to go more in depth, there you go. All right. So Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, she is Brit a British author, uh, lived in England from 1797, born and raised, to 1851, till about 53 years old. All right, so longer life than Jane Austen, but then still not what we would consider a long life nowadays. We would have thought she died before her time, right? Um, but she certainly outlived Jane Austen. Um, her mother was famed writer Mary Wollstonecraft. Remember, we read her, all right? And so I told you when we were reading her that we were going to read her daughter, too. So this is really cool. We have a mother-daughter team. So we read the mother last week. This week we're reading the daughter. All right. So clearly the literary talent runs in that family. Um, her father was noted rationalist philosopher William Godwin. So that's where the Godwin part of her name comes from. The Wollstonecraft part of her name comes from her mother. So she's Mary Wollstonecraft, um, just like her mother's name. And then the Godwin comes from her father. All right. And then the Shelley portion of her last name comes from her husband, who was, quote unquote, rock star poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley. I say rock star because he was kind of famous in his day and women would swoon over him, um, akin to how you know people might try, treat rock stars nowadays so he was he was uh definitely a celebrated poet now mary herself of course was an accomplished writer uh she was often credited with birthing the genre of science fiction so did you know that she's often credited as the person who wrote the very first science fiction novel um in english at least yeah but like I don't know. I mean, I've, obviously, it's hard to know who wrote what when, right? Of all the things written in all of literature and the world, but she's often credited with with being the the uh, inventor of the science fiction genre, or at least of the science fiction novel. Um, so that very first science fiction novel that she wrote was called Frankenstein. So you're probably familiar with that title, right? And she wrote that in 1818. So she was quite young when she wrote that. Uh, or no, it was published in 18, 18, sorry. But she wrote it when she was 19, only 19, in response to a contest in which she, Lord Byron, and her husband, Percy Shelley. So Lord Byron, he was another really famous rock star poet at the time, and women would also swim over him, sw or swoon over him. So these were celebrities in their own right. But anyway, she was married to Percy Shelley and Lord Byron. Byron was their close friend and they were on vacation together uh, and it was raining a lot. Okay. And they thought, what are we going to do in all this rain? So they decided to have a writing contest. Of course, you're with three great writers. What are you going to do? Oh, I know. Let's have a writing contest. So they wrote 
and the and the contest was to write the best ghost story of course in keeping with the rainy theme right like what better than to write a ghost story right and read them to each other and see what we think so anyway guess who won the contest Mary yes Frankenstein won that contest it, yeah, makes sense right Frankenstein what a great novel what a great concept um and it's been made into movies I don't know how many times right and inspired even you know adaptations of the material that you know sort of veer off a little bit but still take the same concept of Frank the Frankenstein monster so anyway yes she wrote Frankenstein we have her to thank for that or Frankenstein however you want to pronounce it right the book encapsulates many themes that actually permeated the 19th century life in Britain including creation versus invention so remember we talked about that theme of um about evolution you know charles darwin of course charles darwin wrote way before this i mean i'm sorry way after this he wrote in i think what or on the origin of species was published in 1869 but kind of people were inventing so much and there were all these theories of like where did humans come from and so there was very much the idea that humans could invent their own reality right um, we, we could make machines that could do work for us. And so this is kind of like the Frankenstein monster was sort of like maybe a bit of a variation on that theme or, um, the next step in it, like, can humanity, like we've invented so much, we've mechanized so much. Can we do the very next thing and actually invent humanity? Can we take hold of our own reality and, and make ourselves, make another human? It's kind of like dovetailing with taking charge of your life, that kind of like humanist philosophy of here we are living on this earth and what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with our time? How do we make ourselves? And so literally they, in the novel, um, Dr. Frankenstein makes his own human. A monster is what people call it, but it, it, he is trying to create life and life he did create in the book. Right. So that's why it's science fiction, obviously. Um, uh, but it also enca encapsulates some other themes from the time period, like um, the burgeoning, uh, burgeoning rights of women and the underprivileged sexuality and that exploration and science and its political and social ramifications. So there are a lot, lot of things that um you see reflected from the time period a lot of themes that were on people's minds like we we're starting to understand so much more science and that led to more ideas and what was the influence of science on our lives how much can be done with science um life was far from blissful however for um literary privileged mary so she was she had a great you know um literary privilege in being the daughter of mary Wallstonecraft and William Godwin, both authors in their own right, and also married to Percy Shelley, another author, and having all these great author friends and she herself being an author. But as we know from two weeks ago, Mary's mother died from an infection contracted during childbirth and died when Mary was only like 10 or 11 days old. So Mary never knew her mother. She inherited that literary greatness and had her literary father William Godwin, but she herself never knew a murder. So very sad that way. Uh, William had actually married Mary Wollstonecraft just before she gave birth to Mary in order to legitimize their daughter because there was still a lot of social pressures against not being married and having a child. Um, even though Mary, William and Mary repudiated the custom of marriage as legalized prostitution because all of the rights that women under British law surrender to their husbands when they marry. So not that they had too many rights, but when she did get married, you were kind of like your husband's um, property, right? And under his auspices. Before you marry, if you're a single woman, you're under your father's auspices. Um, and then remember you had more rights if you were a widow too. So um, not a lot of rights for married women unless their husbands were willing to grant them, right? William wanted to raise Mary on the feminist principles that her mother espoused, so kind of cool, right? 
that, you know, he was of the same mind that way. So he tutored Mary in his liberal philosophies as well as in the classics. So she got a great literary education. He remarried when Mary was only three. And his wife sort of treated Mary as if Mary were Cinderella and the wife were, and the wife um, was the stepmother, right? The ugly stepmother. Um, so, you know, not maybe a great uh, home life there that way. Mary was eventually sent off to live with family friends in Scotland when she was 15. At 15, um, she met one of her father's most ardent admirers, Percy Bysshe Shelley, an aristocratic poet who promised to pay off William Godwin's debts. Although Percy was already married at the time to Harriet Westbrook, from whom he was estranged, Percy and Mary fell in love, and Mary became pregnant. Um, it's kind of sounding a little bit like um, her mother's life, because Mary Wollstonecraft also fell in love with a married man, and then she also became pregnant with William Godwin's baby um, before they married. Well, Harriet Westbrook, Percy's wife, his estranged wife, she refused to divorce her Percy. So Mary and Percy could not marry to legitimize their child. However, at age 17, um, Mary actually had her baby. She was delivered uh, prematurely and died with only two weeks. So, um, yeah, very sad. Two years later, Mary's half-sister, Fanny Imlay from... Um, when it, Mary, when Mary um, had a previous relationship uh, before uh, before Mary was born, um, so she was raised with that and and knew that half sister, um, and Percy's wife committed suicide. So her half sister, Mary's half sister Fanny, and Percy's wife Harriet both committed suicide. Only two years later, so yeah, more tragedy. Mary and Percy married to end their life of adulterous scandals so that they could be awarded custody of Percy's two children uh, from his deceased wife, Harriet. However, the court deemed Percy an unfit parent and awarded the custody the, of his two children to a clergyman. So, very sad. So they deemed him unfit because he was, you know, having children with this other woman out of wedlock, even though that child died, and then his wife, who was very sad, um, even though she was estranged, very sad that, you know, he was carrying on with Mary. She actually committed suicide. Um, so he was deemed unfit to raise the two children he had had with her. So anyway, um, yeah, sad life. Whenever Mary, uh, Mary and Percy, wherever Mary and Percy went, so too did Mary's stepsister, Claire Claremont. So she had that stepsister um, in addition to the half-sister. Um, but she was born with the name Jane, but went by the name Claire. The three spent much time with Lord Byron, the you know, as I mentioned, their dear friend who was in the writing contest with Percy and, and Mary. So they spent a lot of time with Lord Byron. Um, Lord Byron soon fell in love with Claire and fathered a child with her. So a lot of interesting intrigue among these um, writers. Percy also had romantic attachments with Claire. So... He had the romantic attachments of Claire, who was her stepsister, and also, you know, he was married to Mary. Um, but he also had other women because he and Mary believed in the doctrine of free love. However, Percy's romantic attachments still seemed to trouble Mary. 